And please turn with me in your Bibles to Second Peter chapter one. I'd like to also welcome those of us who are joining from home and watching the service. Uh, again, I want to encourage you, if you are watching the service being live stream, um, not to think of it as a, a TV show, which you sit back passively. Um, and I typically, when I watch TV, I turn off my brain and I usually watch mindless things. Uh, even when I watch documentaries, I'm not thinking too carefully about it. Uh, but this is the, the worship of God. And so I encourage you to uh, follow along and pay attention. This is the, the word of God. Um, even if you have a, a Bible, we do have slides that you'll be able to see the Bible verses, but maybe to follow along in your Bible. Um, I also encourage you to follow along with your Bibles, um, being able to find passages and texts. I notice that I'm using my Bible a lot more in my um, iPhone um, and finding it that way, but it's always good to follow along um, in your, your text and, and looking at the Word of God. That's what I'm preaching from. It is the, the Word of God. And uh, that is what needs to be uh, before us. So we, uh, two weeks ago, we took a break last week to look at Thanksgiving. Two weeks ago, we began our study of Second Peter. We learned last, or two weeks ago, that Peter is nearing um, the laying aside of his tent, as he says, in, uh, towards the end of chapter 1 in verses 13 and following. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has made this clear to the apostle Peter and Peter, knowing that he's on his way to death, probably by crucifixion, he is writing a last reminder to the church. He is writing a reminder to us. And he says that in verses 13 and 14, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Peter, who again is near death, death being our enemy, the last enemy to be brought under the feet of Jesus Christ, is writing a very much needed reminder because we live in a fallen and sin-cursed world. Uh, things are not getting any better. And uh, for us, especially as we get older, uh, we face different kinds of trials and temptations. Uh, sometimes there are trials and temptations from without, as Elder Greg reminded us in Psalm 64. Sometimes the trials and the temptations come from the, the weakness and the aging of our flesh and our own loneliness. Uh, so for the Christian, Peter is reminding us that the best is yet to come. And he is reminding, he is writing at the very end of his life, he is writing in such a way so that we, now that we are in the flesh and following the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that we would continue to make our calling and election certain as we one day anticipate seeing the face of Jesus. Today, as we looked at two weeks ago, the best is yet to come. Uh, today, I want to look at verse 4, partakers of the divine nature. And while the best is yet to come as we anticipate glory, uh, I want to look at how you and I will never again be able to participate in the divine nature like we can today. We will live forever but it's only now, in the flesh, in this fallen, sin-cursed world, that you and I can participate in the divine nature in a fallen world and understand the power of Christ. You and I can understand the power of Christ in a fallen world, sin-cursed world, fallen flesh, in a way that we will never again be able to experience when we are in glory. And Peter is writing as a reminder so that we persevere and that we are adding and increasing in our faith. So the things that we are to be or pursuing, which Lord willing we'll be looking at in the weeks ahead, we'll be focusing on partakers of the divine nature. Uh, but we are to be adding, and we won't always be able to do this in a fallen world, but now we can add moral excellence. To the moral excellence we can now be adding knowledge. To knowledge we can be adding self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. So Peter is exhorting us to be growing in our conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is uh, one of the glorious ways uh, in which we are partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature, as we'll be seeing, uh, is not a removal from the, the body. We can participate and partake of the divine nature because we were created both body and soul. And we have an amazing opportunity 
uh, to see the divine power of Christ at work in our sanctification in a fallen world. So I'll be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. Hear the living word of the living God. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my de- departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Well, let us pray. Lord, we thank you so very much for your word and for the diligence of Peter as he was growing up and maturing in you, Lord Jesus Christ, coming to the end uh, of his earthly life as he anticipated putting aside his earthly tent, his dwelling, uh, and his soul being perfected uh, in the full enjoyment of you uh, while he was also awaiting the final resurrection. We thank you for his diligence in writing to us about what we need to be diligent about uh, as we now, as pilgrims, are living by faith, and I pray that we would be increasing and adding to our faith, the excellencies, the virtues, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We pray now uh, that you would be pleased, Lord, to help us to better understand what it means that we are partakers of the divine knowledge. Uh, And uh, may this glorious promise, may this glorious truth, something that we now have begun to partake of, something that we anticipate partaking of, Uh, in final and full glory. Uh, May this motivate us uh, all the more in the pursuit of your eternal kingdom. And uh, we pray these fathers, uh, this father, because thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Peter is writing in verses 1 and 5 to those who have faith in Jesus. Uh, Verse 1 of our text, to those who have received a faith, Uh, Verse 5, now for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith. Peter is writing to the church, those who are Christian. Uh, If you are not a Christian, if you have not put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, this could be one of the greatest days of your entire existence. So I I want to invite you, if you haven't already, put your faith and your trust in this glorious Savior, our triune God, uh, to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and to know him as Savior. And if you have any questions about that or would like to talk further about that, I can't do that right now, but uh, contact me or see me after the, the sermon. And uh, there's nothing more that I, I'd like to talk about uh, than Jesus and following him. Now, for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, Peter is writing so that we would be growing and increasing in our faith. So our faith is not something that is stagnant and something that happened yesteryear. 
Our faith is something that is strengthening, something that we are to be applying all diligence in. And Peter is emphasizing that in verse 5 of our text, this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith. So again, faith isn't stagnant. It's something that we are now to be applying all diligence to. And there is an outcome of our faith. The outcome of our faith is the eternal kingdom. Uh, The outcome of our faith is the increase of qualities in verse 8. The qualities, the fruit of the Holy Spirit are ours. They are increasing. So again, we may have knowledge, but knowledge partaking the divine nature. This kind of knowledge is something that we are growing, increasing in. And as we increase in these things, they will render you neither useless nor unfruitful. You will never be useless, no matter what stage of your life you are. You may feel useless in terms of the world, but you will never be useless if you are increasing your faith. You will never be unfruitful. You and I were saved to be fruitful to the glory of Jesus Christ and to the the praise of God the Father. So as we are growing and increasing of these things, these are ways in which we partake of the the, the divine nature, Um, we will grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of God and his kingdom will also grow and extend to the ends of the earth. So the Christian faith, the Christian life is like a tree that is a, a fruit tree Again, we'll be looking at the, the excellencies, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in verses 5 and through 7, the moral excellence, the knowledge, the self-control, the perseverance, the godliness, the brotherly kindness, and love. And uh, Peter is writing that we would grow and increase in this. But there's also a danger that Peter is warning as he is coming to the end of his life. There's a danger that we would not be increasing in these things. And he writes of that danger in verse 9. He who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So one of the reasons why we grow as Christians and increase in our faith-bearing fruit is because of God's divine power. So this is not a power that comes from within. This is not a natural power. Uh, that is nat- comes naturally to you and to me. Verse 3, it is, it is seeing that his divine power. So it is the power of Almighty God, the power of the Almighty Triune God. He has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And it, according to God's divine power, his promise, we are, in verse 4 of our text, he has granted that we might be partakers Uh, that we might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. This uh, partakers of the divine nature is a a wonderful, wonderful phrase. In fact, I woke up this morning feeling very frustrated because I wanted uh, at least another week, maybe another lifetime, just to meditate on uh, what it is to be a partaker. This is like our identity in Christ to be a partaker of the divine nature. I want to let this sink in more into my mind, into my heart, and like meditation, that's what it is, and to let it just become a part of my understanding of who Aaron Gurner, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, who I am. And, And this is who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are partakers of the divine nature. Uh, sometimes some people might say to you, you know, hey, how are you doing today? Um, and one way you can think about yourself is, uh, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm a partaker of the divine nature. Um, some of the greatest minds in Christian history have, have wrestled with what it means to be a partaker of the divine nature. Uh, some of the great minds like Athanasius or Augustine. Augustine summarized this Uh, by saying that the Son of God became the Son of Man, that he might make the sons of men the sons of God. So a partaker of the divine nature, we are able to partake of the divine nature, Augustine is saying, because the eternal Son of God took upon himself human nature. Jesus is truly God and truly man, and that is why and through whom we can become partakers of the divine nature. I was thinking about saving this sermon for Christmas, but I have to wait a, a month. But that's, that's, the, that's the glory of the incarnation, that we are divine 
Uh, we are partakers of the divine nature because of what Jesus, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, did when he took upon himself flesh and blood. Thomas Aquinas is another one who has thought about the partakers of the divine nature. And he wrote, Thomas Aquinas said that for the human mind and will could never imagine, understand, or ask that God become man and that man become God and a sharer in the divine nature. But he has done this in us by his power, and it was accomplished in the incarnation of his son, that you may become partakers of the divine nature. John Calvin wrote of the partaking of the divine nature in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. And meditating on this, John Calvin said, If the Lord will share his glory, power, and righteousness with the elect, nay, will give himself to be enjoyed by them, what is more excellent will somehow make them to become one with himself. Let us remember that every sort of happiness is included under this benefit. And although we have advanced considerably in this meditation, let us nevertheless acknowledge that if our mental capacity be compared with the height of this mystery, we still remain at the very lowest roots. So my highest mental capacity, John Calvin is saying, the height of my mental capacity, I am still at the lowest root of what it means to be a partaker of the divine nature. So it's to participate in who God is. It is the enjoyment of God. This, and I want you to, as Calvin talks about, um, this is happiness. And we'll come back to that, this happiness uh, in a little bit. Partakers of the divine nature, though, is a, another way of saying in Christ. This is one of those Pauline prepositional phrases that Paul uses over and over again, in Christ. And in Christ is another way of understanding what Peter calls here partakers of the divine nature. Uh, it is a reference to what theologians call our union with Christ. It is what the theologian uh, John Murray called the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. So if you've ever seen a picture of uh, John Murray, um, I think those live streaming can probably see one. It's, he's a dour looking Scotsman um, and he's got this like frown on his face. And I've talked to people who are students of uh, John Murray and uh, the reason he, he kind of has this dour look, um, he's got amazing theology. It's, it's the happiest theology ever. Um, <laughs> it's biblical, um, but it turns out that he actually lost an eye in World War I, and uh, so he has a, a glass eye, so he's always, you know, looking at his students, and again, it's with a very serious and somber look. I, I can't even begin to imitate it, but students could always tell which was the glass eye in John Murray. They said that the glass eye in John Murray is the one that's smiling at you. <laughs> the other one's giving that dour look. Um, but either way, as we, we think about what is partakers of the divine nature, this is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. So this is what Peter is talking about. Um, this is what Jesus taught Peter, is Jesus came to the end of his earthly life. So Peter is at the very end of his earthly life, and Jesus, as he came to the end of his earthly life of humiliation before the cross, you remember in John chapter 13 and following, he began teaching about his relationship to the Father, the coming of another like him, the Holy Spirit, and our abiding and our indwelling within him. And you remember how Je Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verses 4 and 5, he taught Peter and the other apostles, abide in me. So there's this idea of the partakers of the divine nature, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We are, by God's divine power, through faith in Jesus, partakers of the divine nature because, as we've already seen, Jesus is truly God and truly man. Partakers of the divine nature, therefore, and this is part of our identity in Christ, what we are meditating on, what John Calvin said, even at the greatest of our mental capacity and our height for meditating on this, we're still at the lowest root 
for understanding what it means for us to be a partaker of the divine nature. That this is who we are in Christ, being a partaker of the divine nature, is more important than my vocation as a pastor. So for all of the time and the concerns I spend in the past, in my, is my, and this is true for your vocations as well, being a, a partaker of the divine nature is more glorious than your vocation. It is more important than my being a husband or a father. As important as that is, as, as much as I love that, being a partaker of the divine nature is even greater. Being a partaker of the divine nature is one of the glories that it is to be a Christian. It's one of the reasons to put our faith and our trust in Jesus and to desire to be growing and increasing in these spiritual fruits and qualities. Of course, being a partaker of the divine nature goes back to the very beginning of the Bible. What Peter is teaching at the very end of his life isn't something new. It's not like Peter is, is going to go to and be with the Lord and he's like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't remember ever writing back and saying anything and preaching about this. I don't remember anything about this in Paul's letters, which he mentions in chapter 3. I, I better mention being partakers of the divine. No, no. Peter is, is simply summarizing what goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, isn't he? Being partakers of the, of the divine nature goes back to the very, when our first parents, Adam and Eve, when God created us, humanity, after his image. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, and God said, let us. And uh, again, uh, um, as it's anticipating the doctrine of God and the doctrine of the Trinity fully revealed in Jesus, something that Peter expounds upon. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And even though our first parents, Adam and Eve, chose not to participate in the divine nature, they chose not to partake of the divine nature by eating of the forbidden fruit, the glory of redemption and the glory of salvation is that Jesus chose to obey. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And he took upon himself that flesh and blood so that we might be able to fully experience what God originally created us for, communion and enjoyment of him forever and ever. So we did initially, Adam and Eve, participate in the divine nature by virtue of being created in God's image, and that after the fall, God participated in his creation through the incarnation when his beloved son took upon himself flesh and blood. And Peter was an eyewitness to that Obedience, And as he comes to the end of his earthly dwelling, he is reminding, he says, I don't want you to forget this. These are the things, uh, as I come, if I, you know, my last words that I can speak, these are the things I want you to be reminded of. Peter had a lot of things on his mind as he's going to die, but he is diligent in writing and reminding us of this. And of course, participation in the divine nature, um, Peter writes about in, in 1 Peter, uh, it's the rebirth. So this is another way in which we participate in the divine nature. Um, as Jesus taught in John chapter 3, you must be born again. You must be born of God the Holy Spirit. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. So participants or partakers of the divine nature, having this fellowship and communion with God goes back to the rebirth. And just as you know, we might look at a baby and say that that baby, they resemble their, their mom or their dad or their uncle or something like that. As children of God, we are to be resembling God more and more, both in body and soul. We are partakers, again, of the divine nature because of Jesus and because of the Spirit of God who dwells within us. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul speaks of it this way, that because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we don't only look like Jesus in our life and our faith, our self-control, our perseverance, our godliness, 
Uh, we, we sound like the sons of God, like a child, as a child says, Dada or Mama. The Spirit of God who indwells within us enables to call God our Abba, Father, through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4 writes of this partaking of the divine nature in a different way. It's a different phrase, but it's the same thing. He says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. So this is another way of partaking of the divine nature that Peter, the Pentecostal preacher, is teaching the benefits of Pentecost and our new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus taught in John chapter 14 and verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. So the father and the son, they're making above for us. Jesus is in heaven making an abode for us, but they, Father and Son, there's an indwelling, there's a partaking of the divine nature through the work of the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you always, Jesus said, even to the end of the age. And so it, it should be obvious, but it's not obvious as we think about uh, Peter writing about partakers of the divine nature, um, that we could not be partakers of the divine nature unless the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are divine. Partakers of the, the divine nature is Trinitarian. Like the name of God placed upon us in baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is one God, one name, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we are partakers of the divine nature, and, and that is one of the ways that's signified is through baptism. Uh, one of the benedictions highlights the Trinitarian nature of parta uh, being partakers of the divine nature. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and you can kind of compare that with 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, uh, that the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship. That Peter, um, Paul uses that same uh, language in the Greek, the fellowship, the partaking of the Holy Spirit uh, be with you all. So our partaking of the divine nature is Trinitarian. And going back then to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, you might think that partaking of the divine nature sounds something like pantheism, and I sometimes think that we as Christians don't talk in the same language as Peter because this language has been so abused by cults and other religions. Uh, but we need to take it back and we need to own it as the people of God. So when he talks about becoming partakers of the divine nature, some of the commentators I was reading this week seemed uncomfortable with this language. There's one commentator I came across saying about this uh, being, becoming partakers of the divine nature. Uh, he said that Peter's language in this phrase is controversial. Divine nature has a mystical or pantheistic ring. I'm like, whoa, no, 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 no. I, I disagree with my, with my friend here uh, in his commentary. Uh, this language isn't controversial. This language is true. It's the word of God. People's understanding or interpretation of the language is fallible and errant and controversial. But we need to, to own this biblical language. This is our own in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should not be ashamed of this kind of language, even though it has been misappropriated by cults and other religions. We need to take it back and say, no, this is the true meaning of it. Now, we should understand, though, by this, that Peter is not saying that by partaking of the divine nature that we become members of the Trinity. That is absolutely not what Peter is saying. Uh, Peter is not saying that we will in some way become absorbed into God. No, he's not saying that. There will always, forever, be a creator-creature distinction. We will never, ever lose our humanity. We will never, ever lose our personality. Our personalities will become glorified. We will never lose, though, our personality. We will never lose our individuality by partaking or participating in the divine nature. But just because the interpretation of God's word, the interpretation is controversial, 
doesn't mean that we should avoid the language of what God's word says. I mean, it's like a counterfeit, you know, money. You know, there, there are lots of counterfeit $20 bills out there in the world. There's so many counterfeit $20 bills. Would you avoid them? So I'm, I'm going to avoid the, the, the $20 bill. It, it's counterfeit. And the person next to you might say, well, if you want to avoid them, I'll help you out. And, you know, you can give them all to me. You know, why, why would we let the counterfeiter own it? Why, why would we let counterfeit religions and cults own this language? And in Peter's day, when he's writing back in the first century, there were a lot of counterfeits. He's actually using language, this, the, the idea of the divine nature, partakers of the divine nature. The only other time in the New Testament that this word divine occurs is in Acts chapter 17 when the Apostle Paul was in Athens. And when Paul was in Athens, you remember that he went to the Areopagus or Mars Hill. And there, who did Paul address at Mars Hill but the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers? And, and Peter is picking up on this. The, the, the idea of participating in the divine nature has always been misunderstood. But this is the true meaning of it in the incarnation and the work of Jesus Christ. So the Epicureans in Peter's day, they were materialists. Kind of like the materialists of today. Epicureans believed that everything was made up of atoms. Atoms are supreme. The Epicureans in Peter's day said that if there are any gods or goddesses, even the gods and the goddesses are made up of atoms. Furthermore, if there are any gods or goddesses, they are indifferent to the world. They believed, and this is what we find today with deism, this idea that God is distant from his creation. That God is like some kind of clockmaker. He makes everything up like a clock. He winds it up and then he sets it on the table and then he leaves and has nothing to do with it. Well, in Peter's day, the Epicureans were deists. They were materialists. And you look at what Peter is saying in verse 4 of the text and this flies in the face of Epicureanism. That you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And imagine an ancient Epicurean hearing this. There's a reason that Epicureanism was on the decline as Christianity continued to go to the ends of the earth. Here's an Epicurean hearing for the first time, God is immaterial? God is not a part of this creation? Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became incarnate? That God is not distant? That God is near? That's what Peter also, or Paul also preached at the Areopagus. You know, he was near to us. That God is so near that he indwells within his people. We can partake of the divine nature. This is a reason to put your faith and your trust in Jesus and to drop Epicurus and all the other followers and philosophers of Epicureanism. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Epicureanism, that, that's a big, I think, seven-syllable word. We don't know what Epicureanism is today. That's a first century thing. We don't deal with that today. And I'm like, whoa, 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 it's still with us? We still need to understand what it means to be partakers of the divine nature because materialism and deism, unfortunately, is alive and well. It's been dealt a mortal blow by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross, but it just keeps crawling along like a zombie and it will not die. It will finally be crushed, of course, when Jesus returns. This is important for us because in our nation, we are an Epicurean nation. Thomas Jefferson was a self-proclaimed Epicurean. Jefferson was so much into Epicureanism that he owned five editions of his favorite Epicurean philosopher, whose name was Lucretius. Five Latin editions. And he owned two other editions of this Epicurean philosopher, Lucretius, um, in um, Italian and French. And I think he also had one in English. So some of you have your French Bibles that you sometimes follow along with, or German Bibles. This was Je Jefferson's Bible. He himself said, I am an Epicurean. Thomas Jefferson's wall of separation, where do you think that came from? A wall of separation between church and state? That's deism. That's Epicureanism. Jefferson's most famous phrase, of course, is in the Declaration of Independence, isn't it? The pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Brothers and sisters, this is a counterfeit. 
to what Peter writes about entrance into the eternal kingdom. True happiness, going back, remember what Calvin was saying, he said, remember what Calvin says about happiness. True happiness and participation is to be found in the divine nature of God and our participation in God. It is to be found through faith in Jesus. It is to be found in the pursuit of not some kind of deistic, epicurean life, liberty, and happiness. No, Peter says this is what we are to be pursuing in verses 5 through 7. No, excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And our, our nation didn't just have you know, Epicurean and, and some Christian roots. It had very deep pagan roots going back to Epicurus. In fact, you might want to Google sometime, not now, uh, but maybe, maybe later today, uh, the, what's known as the apotheosis, I had to practice this a lot before I preached it, the apotheosis of Washington. The ap apotheosis of Washington is a fresco in the rotunda of the United States Capitol building. And on this apotheosis of Washington, it is a painting that is more than 4,000 square feet. So it's bigger than most of our homes, maybe bigger than twice as big as our homes, maybe four times as big as some of our homes. And it's apotheosis where the laws of our nation are made. This is where Congress meets. It is of George Washington ascended in heaven and becoming a god with a rainbow under his feet and two goddesses on his right and his left. And in this ginormous painting, our lawmakers go under and then they make their godless laws. George Washington, though, of course, as we think about our nation and the pagan roots of our nation, uh, he's not partaking of the divine nature through faith in Jesus. What is happening is he is literally deified in this painting. And this is absolutely pagan. It is completely the opposite of what Peter is saying in verse 4 of our text about partaking uh, of the divine nature. So you have in Peter's day, but it's still with us today, um, this, this kind of idea that everything is material, the gods are absent, some kind of deism. You can't be any closer to God if you're participating of the divine nature and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. If you are united to, by faith to Jesus, the Spirit of God enables you and me uh, to say, Abba, Father. Uh, there was also another um, false teaching in Peter's day that is sadly still alive and well in our own day known as Stoic Stoicism. And Stoicism is the belief that everything is God. And this, of course, wasn't just popular in the Roman Empire in Peter's day, um, but it was outside the Roman Empire. It was found in places where uh, you have religions like Hinduism or Taoism or Buddhism. Pantheism, as we think about partakers of the divine nature, I'm taking this back. I'm not going to let the Hindus hold this. That is a counterfeit. But pantheists say that all is one. Reality is unity without individuality. Pantheism is popular in some kinds of back-to-nature movements. Uh, you'll find it in Ralph Waldo Emerson and his writings. You'll find it in Henry David Thoreau. Uh, the actress, Shirley MacLaine, claims to have an experience of oneness. It's going back to nature, oneness with nature, because everything is allegedly nature. And uh, Shirley MacLaine says she was taking an Andean mineral bath and she says, slowly, slowly, I became the water. I was the air, the water, the darkness, the walls, the bubbles, the candle, the wet rocks under the water, and even the sound of the rushing river outside. So there is, that, and that, this is completely contrary to Second Peter, but I'm not going to let Shirley own the language of the Bible and what God has accomplished in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this idea of the loss of individuality and becoming one with everything else, this is a satanic counterfeit. Reality has always and will always contain both unity and individuality because God is triune. You ever have the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door? or something like the, the Muslims, and say before creation, before God created anything, was pantheism true? 
was reality one? At the very heart and core of it, I, I think that, that's what you'd have to answer. It's the, the trinity of God, both the unity and the diversity, three persons and one God that is able to maintain both a, a creation, the distinction between the creator and the creation, but also to maintain an individuality where our individuality does not get swallowed up. I will not, and as Christians, we should never allow a counterfeit, satanic counterfeit, try to take over this beautiful truth of what it means to become partakers of the divine nature. This reality, this truth that is rooted in the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus is more glorious than any other counterfeit and lie that could ever be concocted in the mind of a fallen angel or in the mind of a fallen man. So how then do we become partakers of the divine nature? How do you partake of the life of Christ? Notice very quickly here that Peter the Pentecostal preacher doesn't mention speaking in tongues. Nor does he mention participation in the divine nature through Eucharistic adoration and transubstantiation. Partakers of the divine nature is through faith in Jesus and applying all diligence in our faith in Jesus by growing up in the likeness of Jesus. We participate in the divine nature by living in this fallen world, but the fallen world doesn't live in us any longer because we have been raised to new life in Christ. And the more you meditate on this, the more exciting it becomes. As I said at the very beginning of the sermon, you and I will never again, this is our only opportunity, we will never again after this life be able to participate in the divine nature like we can today. Yes, we will live forever. We will be glorified in the new heavens and the new earth. But it's only now that we can participate in the fallen nature, or in the divine nature, in a fallen world. There won't always be a fallen world. There won't always be a devil. There won't always be fallen flesh. This is it. Yes, brother and sister, we do sin. But the truly, I think the most freeing thing to know is the divine power of God and to know that experiential, experientially in a fallen, corrupt world by lust, as Peter calls it in verse 4. This is the only opportunity you and I can have to partake of the divine nature in this way. Because after death, that's it. You don't struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil anymore. After death, our souls will be perfected. After death, there will be no more struggle with sin in the divine power of God. But today, and as long as you live in this earthly tent, this is the only time you will be able to trample the serpent underfoot. Romans 16, 20. Today is the day to fellowship with Jesus in his sufferings. Today is the day you can store up for yourself in a way like you won't be able to in the future, store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Today, and you won't always have this opportunity, brother and sister, today is the day to experience that you can overcome in Christ's divine strength. You can overcome in his strength the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. To me, this is the most exciting thing. And I pray that you, by faith, can say, count me in. Amen. These, and this is what I'm going to pursue. Not some kind of Epicurean happiness and love or anything like that. I am going to pursue the knowledge of God and knowing him and knowing his power at work within me. And this is all for our asking. This is what Peter would have us to remember as he was preparing to enter into the blessed presence of God, entering to his rest. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so very much for your promises and for your divine power. Lord, we do confess that more often than we would like, we don't feel the power, even we don't even feel the strength to get up in the morning or to go to work, let alone to have the supernatural power to increase in Christ's likeness. But we thank you that this is not our power that we are trying to uh, summon up within ourselves. We thank you that it is your divine power, and that it is your divine power that is at work 
in every one of your people because we are united to Jesus Christ by faith. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would make us useful. Uh, We pray that we would be more and more fruitful in the true knowledge of Jesus. And may we give ourselves in the days ahead to understanding uh, these qualities of divine work, the work of the Holy Spirit, so that we will never lack any of them, so that we will not become as Peter warned, that we would not become blind or short-sighted. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.